Ponyfans.com here with new SMU cornerbacks coach Stefan McClure. And coach, you spent the last couple of years on the SMU staff as a graduate assistant. When you joined the staff, were you given any kind of assurance that if there was a future opening in the secondary, you would be next in line to get a full-time assistant coaching position? No, when I first joined the staff, uh, I was really just given an opportunity like anyone else, just you're going to be a graduate assistant. Uh, we'll give you an opportunity to do that. What you do with that from here is going to be on you. So, I mean, I had no coaching experience before. So Coach Dykes just went off of just uh, our relationship that we had back at Cal and, and kind of just my work ethic there and was like, hey, if you want to coach, he's going to work hard. So I don't know if he can coach, but he's going to put the effort in. And then uh, the rest is kind of what, what you make it, what uh, you're building your resume every single day. All right, so you spent a couple of years building that resume, and then Coach Curtis left, so now there's an opening. Did you go to Coach Dykes and ask to be considered, or did he come to you and say, you're my guy? How did the, the transition take place? Um, I was actually in the middle of transitioning myself to leave and take, a, uh, take another GA job somewhere else. So I was in the middle of uh, – I was actually – hadn't been in the facility for a few days because I was uh, – I was leaving. I was headed to a, I was headed to another school. And then um, luckily with the snowstorm, it got delayed for a week. So I didn't move. So I was still here in Dallas. And then on Saturday, I was headed to the barbershop, get a haircut. And then uh, then I get a call like, hey, are you still in Dallas? Where are you at? Um, some things are, are changing here at SMU. Um, and then I told him I was still in Dallas and that I was leaving tomorrow, more, Sunday morning. To, to head to that other school, they're like, oh, well, uh, if you don't mind, we'd probably stick around. Don't, I probably wouldn't leave on Sunday. So then that happened on Saturday around my haircut appointment was at like 1.30. So that happened right before that, around like 1 o'clock. And then, uh, yeah, then it, it moved pretty quickly from there. So were you surprised to get that call? What were your emotions like when you officially became an assistant coach rather than a GA? Um, so yeah, it happened. Uh, so I went to dinner with coach Dykes later that night and, um, that's, uh, we were just talking and stuff and that's when he, he offered it. I probably said yes before he even, uh, before he even got it out. So, uh, I was a little overambitious, um, <laughs> but I was, I was excited to the, when I came here, that's something that I was working for and, and trying to work towards and kind of trying to show that I'm, I'm ready for that position, ready for that role. So it was, it was, great to to be rewarded with that for for the two years of hard work and and just kind of still building and this is really just the beginning it's a now now one of my parents and uh, like now my dad and a couple of my friends we were just talking and it was like yeah not much is going to change but but now you're getting judged by the results before you know you were helping and and you know you yeah it didn't fall on you as as the primary coach but now now you're judged for these for these results of these players out here. So it's it's good though. I like the opportunity. So as you said, graduate assistants are sort of coaches in training. You're getting your feet wet learning. But you've obviously been around coaches all your life as a player and then the last couple of years as a GA. What are the biggest adjustments or changes for you now that you're no longer a GA? I mean, like you said, the I guess you get the credit and the blame when for what goes on on the field, but on the day to day, are there significant changes in your, your role? Uh, I mean, outside of just working with, with a different group of guys, the, uh, there's not really not much changes because, uh, last year I was fortunate enough. Coach Kane kind of let me have my own position group and have a group of guys, like four or five guys that I was, that I was the coach of that, that exact position. So not much has changed there. Got a couple more numbers now, got a, uh, got a different office. So, so that part's pretty nice, but, um, yeah, not, not much has changed a little, it's really same as it's just more, you have just more responsibility and you gotta, you gotta be accountable for all those guys. There's no, Hey, coach Kane, uh, what do you think we should do with this person? They, they missed class today or they were late to tutoring. Now it's just all on me. Like, Oh, I get the emails from, from the academic advisor and just, uh, just more, 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 I'd say, administrative type type stuff that you have to that you have to deal with when you're the position coach considered compared to a GA. You mentioned that you've had a relationship with Coach Dykes because of course you played at Cal while he was coaching there. And 
actually David Grew was also there as a, a graduate assistant. But as far as Coach Dykes, how did your relationship with him change over the last couple of years now that you were coaching with him rather than playing for him? Um, I would say I've got to know him more when I was uh, – well, here's the thing, though, too, with Coach Dykes, he's very, like, people pe – like, he's a people person. He's he's very approachable to talk to. So when I was in college, I had numerous conversations with him. And then as far as how recruiting goes, I was always helping him recruiting and hosting official visits. So we would always be at his house when he was at Cal. So I had been around him a lot, and his family's great. His, um, his three kids and, and uh, Miss Dykes, they're really great. They're very open. So I've had a great relationship with them. And now kind of on the coaching side – I'm just around him more, like get to get to be in meetings with him and and see the stuff that he was telling us as players that he really means that and follows through with it when he's telling us like, look, I got to hold you accountable. And, and that's my job. I got to make sure you graduate. So that's what I'm going to do. And then you see the reasons behind different things that he had to do. And when you were a player and you're like, I don't get why we're doing this. But then now when you're on the coaching side, you're like, oh, it makes sense. Got to got to do it like this. Got to do things like that. Got to got to share information like this. So it just, it makes more sense. It's kind of full circle on, on the why, why things happen the way they do. When you were playing for him at Cal and you had all those conversations that you mentioned, did the subject of a coaching future ever come up then? Or was it something that crossed your mind after you were in the NFL? Uh, it did come up then. So we used to have that uh, at Cal, we used to have those high school camps. And um, so we had, we had one before and, I coached one of those, one of those teams long weekend. It was brutal. I'm not going to lie. It was, it was a long weekend, but, uh, but it was fun. It was fun. We had, I had a, uh, had a team with like, so whole teams would show up with their coaches, but the team that uh, me and the, another guy, Burl Toller, who was a, a QC at the time there at Cal that we coached was just individuals or groups of people that came and kind of made a renegade team. So we coached that group. They had no coach. And I just remember I was out there coaching this and that. And then the DB's coach was like, oh, are you you look like you kind of enjoyed coaching a little bit out there. Are you going to try to coach afterwards? So then that's kind of how the conversation got brought up. I was probably a, a junior when we had that camp. So it was it was fairly early. And then I remember when I was when I was getting done, uh, obviously pursuing the league, there's no guarantee with that that that's going to happen. And I remember my first year I did get let go for a little bit during um, like from the practice squad. So I wasn't on team for, for a few weeks. And I remember reaching out to coach Dykes trying to, trying to GA there. And he was like, yeah, if you're interested, we'll, uh, we'll get the ball kind of rolling. But then once we started getting the ball rolling, I got picked up again. And then I was like, yeah, I don't think I'm a GA yet. We'll hold, we'll hold off on it. So then GA. And then when the opportunity came around again, um, when I had got released again, uh, after a couple more years, he reached out and was like, Hey, if you want to, uh, if you want a GA, let me know. And I was like, okay, I got a couple workouts lined up. If nothing sticks, then I'll for sure be in contact with you and I'll make a decision, you know, early. Uh, I think I told him like after Thanksgiving, I'll let him know. And then after Thanksgiving came around, nothing, nothing stuck. And I was, we got the ball rolling and made it official. And I was there January of 2019. A lot of coaches, most coaches, talk about recruiting as the lifeblood of any program. And this will be your first stint as a recruiter. But on the other hand, you also have the advantage of being able to sell recruits on the idea of you know exactly what it's like to play for Coach Dykes. Does that almost give you an advantage on the recruiting trail, even though this is going to be your first go-round? Oh, yeah, it absolutely. It gives – and I feel like I have a couple of different, different advantages being young, um, playing for coach Dykes. When you're talking to parents and you're, you're talking about this is the type of head coach that you want to play for that takes care of his players. Now players that work hard, you're building your resume as a player every single day, the way that you carry yourself, the way that you work, the way that you handle your academics. So when you do that the right way and coach Dykes knows there's something that you're interested in and he takes care of his players, hiring former players, he had reached out to me. Like I said, he didn't have to reach out to me. I was just, I wasn't even, I was still trying to play. He didn't have to reach out to me. And we had been in contact. He had wrote me a couple letters when I was on a couple different teams and just congratulations and, and good luck during camp this year. So he, when he followed up and reached out to me when I got released that last time and was like, Hey, do you want to GA? Those are the type of coaches you want to play for that genuinely care about their players. And it's like, 
it's a relationship that's bigger than just football. So selling that to the recruits and to the, um, and to the parents is huge because it's a, it's a genuine relationship and that's who, who you want to play for. And, and he's always kept his word with me and, and done right and everything like that. And you could see it just all throughout the facility. There's a bunch of people that, that want to work with him. The DC wanted to work with him. That's why, that's why he came here. So when someone has that, that track record and, and shows it with their actions, it makes you really want to really want to be here. So I really feel like that helps with, with recruiting. And then a lot of these kids want to want to make it to the league and just having the opportunity to build a, build a play in the NFL, play at the highest level against those guys kind of to speak on that lets it helps in recruiting as well. You mentioned signing and getting let go in the NFL and then joining another team. And if I did my homework right, you signed five times with four teams, twice with Detroit. Uh, yeah. Is there anything in that experience going from one team to another to another that sort of leaks over into your coaching style or in the lessons that you can share with your players? Um, yeah, appreciate every opportunity that you have. You can, uh, you can be at work one day playing football, and then at the next day you're on a flight headed back home with, uh, with no job. And then, uh, so just really be thankful for your opportunities and take advantage of everything that you get. You know, take advantage of every rep, how you do one rep, uh, determines if you get another rep and then uh, also just kind of that that flows over into my coaching styles I got to learn from a lot of good coaches a lot of defensive minded coaches so you got to learn a lot of different techniques be around a lot of a lot of blessed and fortunate players that can play football at a high level and do different things at at a very elite level so really just learning all that football knowledge and soaking it in and how to watch film how to understand concepts are all stuff that have helped shape and mold me into into the coach that I am today and, and always still just willing to learn and, and, and learn and grow even more. You're one of three new guys on the defensive staff. Obviously your defensive coordinator, Jim Levitt, uh, the defensive line coach, Jadera Uzo Daribe, but you're a little different than them because you know the players who are coming back and you know the rest of the staff having been here for a couple of years as a GA. Without having that time where you've got to get to know everybody, what are your first steps as you take over this position group? Uh, just like you said, so I, I know the, uh, the corners, I know the, the actual players, but now it's, it's more so just building that, that true relationship with them, really sitting down, finding out their why, finding out their goals in life, finding out how they got to SMU, learning their story and them learning my story. So that's been the biggest thing that I've been working on just my first couple weeks that I've been hired is sitting down with that group and really getting to know them. And then also just reaching out to their parents and uh, introducing myself to their parents. I know some of their parents, especially some of the newer guys, the younger guys that, that were here during recruiting uh, while I was here that we were recruiting. But uh, yeah, just building that relationship with their parents, making sure it's open communication, good and bad, and letting the parents know that I'm gonna keep you informed, keep you in the loop on, uh, hey, your son's gonna get to start this week. Yeah, the game's at, the game's at Tulsa, but he's gonna get to start. He's gonna play a lot. If you guys can, it'd be, great opportunity for you guys to go see his first career start. Hey, so-and-so is struggling in this class. We got to make sure, you know, I, I've been on him, trying to hold him accountable and hold him accountable uh, and just let him know, like, we're going to, we're going to make sure we're graduating. So if you talk to him in the, this week, ask him about how his classes are going. Cause sometimes the kids don't, don't speak up. They're not going to be like, Oh, I'm struggling in this, you know, geography class. They're, they're not going to say that. So kind of keeping the parents in the loop is a, uh, is really big, but, First, you got to introduce yourself to them and, and know them and let them know that they can they can reach out to you via text or call. In Coach Levitt's defense, are there going to be significant changes in what the corners are asked to do, or is it going to look pretty similar to what you and Coach Curtis were teaching last year? Um, I think just just being around football, there's not a lot of – there's no one's reinventing the wheel for football. Now it's just all there, there's you're, there's only so many coverages that you can play. So there's going to be a lot of similarities and, and, a, and a couple of things that are that are tweaked and different techniques that are used and and different verbiage that's going to be used. And uh, and there will be there will be some there will be some changes for sure that uh, that will happen because Coach Levitt's going to have his his way that he wants guys to play and ways that he's had guys played in the past. And that's going to be my job to make sure we get it, get it coached up and get it, get it run exactly how he likes it. So, that, so I can just carry out the vision that he has for our defense. What do you think of the group of corners coming back? And 
Do any of them remind you at all of yourself as a player? <laughs> these these guys are good, man. These guys are we got some real good players. I they don't they don't want to be compared to me at all. They're 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 all they're all their own people. They all bring something unique to the uh, to the team that I love. They all got great personalities, great hard work, and um, I, I like this group. They're they're a close knit group. They um, they work hard. They put the work in. They're they're accountable, and they're always striving to to get better. They always want to they always want to get coached a little harder. They always want to. Um, find out how they can do a rep better, what they did wrong. So, so that's what I'm most excited about a group that, that always wants to get better and doesn't think they've made it or doesn't think they've arrived to at any capacity. And they want to, they're all striving for something and want to, and want to be the best. So I like that about this group. Some coaches believe in matching up your top corner with the other team's top receiver and chasing them all over the field. Others say that you're going to keep some on the left, some on the right. Where do you fall on that? Um, it all depends on how, how we're looking as a team and whatever we need as a team. You really don't want to get caught up, match up. Some, I mean, I have two philosophies about it. When you're following somebody around, now, now a team can get a beat on what you're doing and, and kind of eliminate that corner. If he's, if he's an impact player on your team, they can kind of eliminate him, put him over here, put him over here to the boundary and then put trips to the field. And now they know who to, who to isolate there. They can determine and know what look you're going to get. So I like kind of just playing left and right. And then in certain situations, you can really match up well. But uh, I, I really like just just putting the the tough down on, on everybody. Hey, everybody, we got we to gotta play. Everyone's got to make their plays. You got to earn your scholarship. And and just you show that kind of faith in guys like, hey, I believe you can you can cover this person. We're going to we're going to drill it all week. Know the proper technique. I'm going to do a great job of breaking down the film, knowing his releases, knowing different alignments, different splits that he likes to kind of give you a tip on what routes he's going to run. And then we're going to go out there and compete and, and play hard. So I like, I got, I got both, both ideas on it. Sometimes I like a field and boundary corner. Sometimes I like someone that, that will follow someone and, and be on the isolated side. So it all kind of depends on how we shake out after, uh, after spring ball, really to kind of determine what we're going to, what we're going to do. But I like to like to have options and, and do whatever's best for, for our team. And uh, and kind of I haven't talked to Coach Levitt about that, what he wants to do. But I mean, I'm op I'm open for all, open for all. He's got a lot of football experience, a lot of knowledge. So I just I just like to listen, kind of ask him a question, and uh, then just sit back, take notes, and really learn and listen from him. Playing in the secondary obviously is different than any other group on the field because a mistake could end up with the other team in the end zone. Uh, because of that, do you have any hesitation about playing freshman? Or playing newcomers, if you get a transfer in, who's still getting used to the the system, his teammates, all of that. No, I have no, I have no problem playing freshman at all. I believe in, I believe in the best player should play, and uh, and it's, and I believe if a if a freshman's ready, uh, mature enough physically, mentally, emotionally, and can handle it, then it's my job to put him in the best situations to be successful. Now, do I always believe the best situation to be successful is the first snap of the of the season in college and he goes out there and starts? I don't know. Depends on depends on what guy we have. But do I believe it's my job to to put him in the best situation and kind of ease him in there and and help close that gap from a senior in high school to, to being in college? Yes. And just giving him all the confidence because you never the worst thing you can do is put a freshman out there when he's not ready and, and kind of shoot his confidence like that. The best thing you can do is, is just build him up, keep building him up, give him a little bit on his plate, maybe give him a package that he can go in. Hey, you're going to go in on this nickel package. You're just going to play man to man. It's real simple. Not a lot of thinking. Hey, you're going in on dime. Hey, it's, you're in our third down package when we put five DBs out there. And then it gradually kind of grows into hey, now. Now you're the starter. So it's all it's all about just progressing and, and prolonging him along. Now, if he if he's ready before that and he's ready week one. I'm going to put the freshmen out there. The best, the best players will play, and uh, whoever gives us the best chance to win. When you're evaluating, what, whether it's recruits or potential players, how do, you, how do you evaluate that, the confidence, the mental toughness, that you know that you'll have a player who can either make a mistake and bounce back or not let the mm -hmm. moment be too big for him? Yeah, so you got to do that by, by, one, talking to the kid. 
uh, talking to his coaches, talking to talking to his teachers. I mean, you you got to really get to know the kid, and you can you can kind of find out a little bit about that confidence. And then also, you got to do your do your research. You can't just watch the highlight tape. You got to watch full games because if you play DB, you're going to give up a catch. He's going to miss a tackle. He's going to, you know, maybe he's going to get a pass interference penalty. So you got to watch those clips and see see how he responds to a little adversity. How does he respond? Does he? The worst thing he can do is let one play beat him twice. And, that, and that's why I tell our guys never never let one play beat you twice. Like if you if you miss a tackle, next play just shake it off and, and go continue to play. The worst thing you can do is hang your head, give up, be frustrated, press. And, and then make another compounded mistake because you're still thinking about the last one. But uh, with, with recruits, it's all, it's all about just getting to know them, building that relationship, talking to them, constant communication, uh, talking to their high school coach. How does he respond to adversity? How does it, tell me a time when, uh, tell me how he, how he played the next play after getting beat for a touchdown. Uh, what does he do? To, is he a type of guy that argues with the refs if he, if he gets a penalty? Um, how, how is he when he plays baseball? All right. The, the, is, how does he compete when it's three, two? Is he looking at the ref? Is he mad at the ref? Does he, after he makes an error, I remember when I played baseball, sometimes if I, if I was at shortstop and I threw a little one hopper to the first baseman, chances are the next one might go over his head. I'm overcompensating. But um, so just, just finding out how, how they respond when they're in those, uh, those tough situations, whether it's another sport in the classroom, on the football field, but just doing your research with them. So looking at when you played, if you got beat for a touchdown or if you missed a tackle or something, you obviously were able to shake it off, not let the play defeat you twice because you kept progressing through college and into the pros. Is that something that's just part of a player's DNA or is that something that can be taught? Uh, it's something that can be it's something that can be taught and you can you can learn that because and it, and it comes with confidence and and having a belief in yourself that you can make a play. And it also it also happens over trust. You got because every every play you don't do every single play properly, right? You don't do it right. But when you have trust and you have that re relationship with your coach, and your coach trusts you, like okay, you're gonna you're gonna get beat sometimes. But when you have that trust with your teammates and your coach, you're able to shake that off because you know, like, all right, I might have messed that one up, but I know exactly what I did wrong. Let me go back to my alignment job eyes so I can make this next play. Let me let me just lock in one snap and clear one snap and clear because those same players that that sometimes that will let a play beat them twice for a negative play. They'll let, they'll let a good play get them beat for, for a, a negative play. Cause they'll, they'll do a really good job, right? Make a great play, get an interception. They jump the out route. Awesome. But so now next time they're just sitting there looking at the quarterback and trying to catch another out route and the guy runs a go route, but it's like, man, he was, he was guessing cause he, he made that one play. Now he thought, Oh, I don't have to trust my, my eyes. I don't have to trust my technique and kind of, kind of mess it so mess it up so it's always it's all it goes both ways so good plays can can lead to mistakes and bad plays can lead to mistakes or bad plays can lead to great plays but I think it's a learned thing that you can you can learn to to do by by how you practice and always having a one snap and clear mentality and uh, the next rep is going to be my best rep the next rep is the most important rep this next play is the only one that matters not three plays from now not three plays ago it's this current play that I'm on right now is the only thing that that matters but it's it's funny i say that because it's that that fine line where it's use history to make history so you have to understand too like hey what did what did they just try to run on me in this situation on third down what did they maybe have a little success with last time on third down so you have to use that history so you still got to kind of remember the past plays but don't let them get you down so yeah to play to play db you got to be mentally tough so you got to be – and that's why with freshmen, you got to make sure they're physically, mentally, and emotionally tough enough to get out there and, and play. This is going to be your third season at SMU, but your first as the full-time assistant. And so with that, is your anticipation or excitement about spring ball or preseason camp in August any different than the last two years when you were a GA? Um, I mean, absolutely. I'm, I'm very excited. I've all like this is one of the this is kind of what I've it's it's rare that people get to get to have two dream jobs in in one lifetime you know and and I've got to have both of mine from when I was a child I wanted to be uh playing the NFL 
and got to achieve that. And then afterwards, I was like, do I want to coach? Do I want to go into broadcasting? Do I want, what do I, what do I want to do? And then went to coaching and now I was like, all right, I want to GA for two years. And then I was trying really hard to get a job, interviewed at a couple other schools for some other corner jobs and uh, nothing, nothing stuck, nothing happened. So it's like a, a dream come true to be able to one, stay in Dallas, work with Coach Dykes, work with this staff, work with these players here that I know and uh, be at SMU where there's so much history and so much tradition and we're, we're on the rise. We're steady on the rise. So it's a, it's very exciting. I'm excited every single day I get to come to work uh, 5 a.m., you know, 5.50 in the morning. So it's just, it's, uh, I would say, yeah, I'm, I'm more excited just because I, I like the challenge and I like the opportunity of, of being able to coach these guys and, and try to try to help them achieve their goals. Cause I had some really good coaches in, in my day. So really just trying to achieve, help them achieve greatness in everything that they do on and off the field.